thank Ilse and the organizers uh, for providing me an opportunity to come and talk about some of the work that we do at FDA. Um, I also want to thank uh, my FDA colleagues, uh, Jessica Cooper, as, um, as well as uh, Katie Carlos, because they probably set up a good framework for me to talk about um, the work that I'm doing uh, that have been doing as it relates to uh, post-market review of epoxidized soybean oil in uh, food contact applications. Uh, this work was a collaborative effort with uh, myself and um, uh, Dr. Omari J. Bandele, who's here in the audience. So if I mess up, he'll come back, come up here and uh, fix the toxicology piece uh, of this, this talk. And so just a brief outline, I'll, I'll give a snippet of what we do in OFAS, um, our post-market safety assurance, and then I'll talk about our um, post-market review of ESPO. And so I, I, I think it's uh, appropriate to take an opportunity to talk about our pre-market programs. For most of you, you're familiar with the food contact side of our, our program, but we also have our FAP, which is our uh, food additive petition, our color, color additive petition program. Uh, this is a mandatory program in order to uh, use food additives um, directly in food. Um, we have our grass program, which is voluntary, but it's strongly encouraged. Um, and this program was incepted in 1997. Um, the, the information that is provided by notifiers are typically supported by uh, the public consensus of safety. Um, we have our biotech notification program, which is much, as, much like our grass program. And then, of course, the food contact substance program. Um, again, this is much like our FAP, which is a mandatory program. Uh, as the FAP program uh, relates uh, promulgates a regulation, but our food contact notification program uh, is an allowance of an effective uh, notification or, or use of a food additive uh, as it relates to its intended use. That information is published on our website. Um, and so you can uh, go to our website and see the effective notifications of uh, food contact materials or, or food additives in use in food contact materials. Now, while our pre-market program is, encompasses the majority of the work that we do in OFAS, we do have our post-market program. Much of what you've heard previously is related to bisphenol A. Um, of course, uh, FDA wrapped up that work in around 2014 when we determined that FDA's per current perspective is that BPA is safe um, at the current levels occurring in food. Uh, much of the information as it relates to that review is located on our website, and so you can go to that website, find as much information as it relates to BPA. Um, we also are doing work as it relates to our infant safety assessment. Of course, this is a, uh, a crucial, a critical uh, group, and so a lot of work um, have been done within our within OFAS in order to develop a safety assessment for the use of food contact materials for the, this population. A uh, former FDA employee uh, was very instrumental in developing um, test protocols for our infant guidance, which we, we expect to see uh, posted by the end of the year um, for industry to use. We currently have our orthothalate esters uh, project. Uh, this is uh, in relation to a FAP that was filed in April of 2016. That work is ongoing. Um, Katie uh, is doing some work in the laboratory, perhaps as a result of the, the caution of the orthothalate esters um, and food contact materials. We have several other projects that are going on in our labs as it relates to uh, antioxidants. Uh, polyolefins looking at low molecular weight oligomers, metallocene catalysts that of, of course are used in the production of polyolefins, uh, antimony trioxide, I think we saw some work yesterday as it relates to uh, antimony trioxide in, in PET. And that brings us to my work which is related to these phthalate alternatives. Um, as Katie mentioned, the chat report was published in 2014. 
um, as it relates to understanding the chronic effects or chronic hazards to phthalates in uh, consumer products, not just food contact applications, but consumer products. And this graph shows, uh, this was published in 2014 in the Chemical Economics Handbook as a uh, regarding the use of phthalates in, in the U.S. Um, as you can see, there's not much mobility or change in the amount of uh, phthalates used in products. But for DHP, we see that there is a de decrease in the use of phthalates in, in products in the U.S. And so, of course, it's, uh, as it relates to uh, some, of the, uh, some of the literature that have come out about phthalates in consumer products, um, we've heard about Prop 65. And so um, the FDA is really interested in understanding um, how are plasticizers used from a global standpoint um, and how do they relate to the use of phthalates. As you can see, phthalate still dominates the market. Uh, globally, about 70% of consumer products uh, use or uh, those that require uh, plasticizers use phthalates. Then we have some that are phthalate alternatives. But the market is expected to um, show a, a trend of increase of these phthalate alternatives. So what FDA is interested in is being ahead of the game and, and understanding the safety assessment of these phthalate alternatives uh, in food contact materials. And so our project was focusing on gathering information both in the literature as well as in our agency files. Um, as it relates to dietary exposure and the toxicity of these non phthalate plasticizers and food contact materials. Summarize the information and then provide a updated consumer exposure um, so that the agency will have a reference point um, as it relates to safety assessments of these phthalate alternatives. We initi initiated this work in 2014, um, beginning with adipates. Uh, we were able to find about 13 adipate-based plasticizers across uh, our regulations, uh, with DEHA being the most representative of the adipate um, that was found in food contact materials. Particularly, PVC clean film uh, was shown to have or, or use the most of DEHA DHA as a, as a non-phthalate plasticizer. Um, our cumulative dietary exposure um, concentration for uh, DHA, DHA in PVC clean film was about 2.4 parts per million. And so that was our initial uh, work. Uh, we did not publish this work, but it was more of an internal investigation into non-phthalate uh, plasticizers. And then in 2016, uh, we decided to investigate epoxidized soybean oil. Um, we found it was uh, listed in our regulation um, uh, in, in 10 of our uh, 21 CFR regulations. Uh, epoxidized soybean oil, uh, like, like DEHA, was the most represented epoxy ester and used in food contact materials. Uh, the literature, uh, did not give us much information as it relates to a clear indication of correlation between uh, fat content, migration, uh, contact with surface areas, or time and temperature, but it did offer some understanding of uh, what we would anticipate in terms of migration. Just to advance where what I will talk about is we found a CDC uh, for ESPO uh, in both PVC gaskets and PVC films of 2.6 uh, parts per million and then a CDI of 8 milligrams, milligrams per person per day. Uh, this work was published last year in October of 2018 in Food Additives and Contaminants. So as Katie uh, initiated talking about epoxidized soybean oil, I'll show here a representative structure. It's a long chain fatty acid incorporating unsaturated fatty acids as well as saturated fatty acids. Lanolinic acid is the major component um, comprised of 50%. Um, and when we initiated our work, 
uh, we wanted to really mine the literature to see what work uh, was included as it relates to epoxidation. Um, we wanted to understand uh, what the the composition of these plasticide, the composition of the the plasticizer in both PVC gaskets as well as film. Um, we also wanted to understand the the concentration, um, and we also wanted to uh, to understand migration as well as to see if any other plasticizers were used in in combination with ESPO. So uh, we were able to find about 20 literature references. Some of them were good, some of them were not so good. Um, but of the 20, 20 references, we were able to obtain about eight that gave us the criteria that we were interested in, in reviewing for uh, our uh, migration as well as safety assessment. And so one of the first things that we wanted to understand was the levels of ESPO uh, in food contact materials. Uh, two studies, one in 1998 um, was a European study, uh, and then we also found a 2002 Korean study. Now, much of the work had been done in the early 1980s. Uh, Lewis Castle was very instrumental in looking at um, epoxidized or, or ESPO in food contact materials and understanding the chromatogramic, uh, the understanding the analytical uh, properties of, of ESPO in food contact materials. But these two journal articles um, provided us a snapshot of the amount of ESPO in food contact materials. As you can see, uh, levels were as high as about 30%, uh, particularly for a PVC gasket. But they also looked at films, um, they looked at rigid PVC bottles uh, for fruit drinks, as well as, um, as, well as uh, rigid PVC bottles for edible oils. Um, so understanding that ESPO might not have been the principal plasticizer used in food contact materials. Um, we found an article, it was a European study in 2004 that analyzed 68 gaskets. Of these 68 gaskets, 62% gaskets, of them included uh, ESPO as the principal plasticizer at levels greater than 10, 10%. The additional plasticizers that were included were not only non-phthalate, but phthalate plasticizers, the DNIP as well as DEHP. And DEHP was included in, along with ESPO, at levels up to 19%. <coughs> so if you think back to one of the original, one of the original slides where I showed you uh, the decrease in, in DEHP and food contact materials. Um, while it may not uh, plateau or go to zero, it perhaps may de continue to diminish or uh, decrease in, in use, but perhaps it is used with non-phthalate plasticizers, which is in, uh, important um, because perhaps DEHP offer benefits that some of the non-phthalate plasticizers uh, do not offer. And so our next evaluation was to look at PVC-based gaskets um, and the migration of ESPO from these, uh, from these gaskets in glass jar lids. Um, of the surveys, we found about eight market surveys. Again, some of them were pretty good and some of them weren't so good in terms of giving us a comprehensive review of looking at uh, uh, foods in various types of foods. Two market surveys, one in 2005 was a Swiss market survey, looked at about 160 oil-based products, um, and then there was a 2000 European study that looked at about 226 uh, oil-based food products. In both cases, ESPO was contained in these uh, gaskets for the glass lid jars at levels up to about 45%. Uh, the average migration for the Swiss market was about 216 parts per million, while the average migration level in the, two, in the 2012 European market survey was about 30 parts per million. 
So at FDA, we like to sometimes take conservative measures to make sure that we cover all our bases and really understand the, the migration of uh, indirect food additives. And in this case, we decided to use 216 as a appropriate measure uh, to determine the exposure to ESPO in these food contact materials. Now, this study was based on, on gaskets. Um, and as I mentioned before, the two major uses were gaskets and PVC film. So the next study was to look at ESPO and PVC-based food films. Now, in our search of the literature, um, we, we found um, several different sources, but it didn't provide us with a comprehensive review um, in how food film is actually used. And so we went back to our agency files and found this 1990 um, uh, math surveillance report that was actually reported in an FAP um, that was an industry survey on plasticizers and film, film wraps. Um, this survey looked at supermarket film wraps, food service film wraps, and housewares. And this data was reported and published in 1990. Um, it was a comprehensive study. Um, and in the study, they determined a dietary concentration of ESPO in film wrap of 1.6 parts, parts per million. So half of my work had been done because I didn't have to do a, uh, a dietary concentration calculation. It had already been done in the survey. We found the, the data to be relevant, um, as well as we found it to be, this study to be the most comprehensive of anything that we found in the literature. So as Dr. Cooper mentioned, um, we use consumption factors. Um, in order to determine our exposure estimates. As I mentioned, for the film food wrap, uh, the dietary concentration had already been determined at 1.6 parts per million. We found no reason to uh, change or to modify that value. Um, the consumption factors that were used uh, were appropriate. However, for the gaskets, uh, we used the uh, Swiss market survey uh, 216 parts per million, and the consumption factor that we applied was 0 0.05. Now, at that time, Dr. Cooper, they were still working on uh, determining um, the, the revising consumption factors, but we were a little ahead of the game because in the, our current guidance, the consumption factor for glass is 0.1. And if you go to your grocery store, you'll find that uh, there are different types of um, uh, different types of jars or different types of containers. Not all of them are glass. And so the market now has PET. We have multi-layer materials for holding um, holding fatty foods. Uh, think about peanut butter lined in glass jars and a in a plastic jar. Um, and so we thought this number was developed about 25 years ago. So let's revise that value for our current use of, of, of our current use of um, food contact materials to using one, uh, 0 point, uh, 0 0.05. I think Dr. Cooper reported 0 0.6, but there's not much of a difference. Um, and so we get a dietary concentration for uh, ESPO from the use in uh, PVC gaskets of one, point, of one parts per million. When we add these two uses together, we get a cumulative dietary exposure of 2.6 parts per million and a CDI of eight milligrams per person per day. Now hang on to that number because we're going to, um, we're going to look at that value later on as it relates to um, as it relates to our toxicology um, review. And so Dr. Bandelay was on the other side of the research and he was looking at several, reviewing several toxicology studies. This table shows the toxicology studies as it relates to ESPO in food contact, uh, in food contact materials. There were two uh, subchronic studies, one for dogs, one for rats. Uh, we had a one generation reproductive study for rats, uh, both female and male, a teratology study for female rats, 
and a chronic uh, two-year uh, chronic study. This was this study was done according to GLP um, for for females. Ten minutes, okay. Um, done according to uh, GLP, and Dr. Bandelay uh, determined that this was the most appropriate study um, that was was uh, conducted. Uh, the the low L or the dosage for these rats uh, was 1,000 for the males, 1,000 micrograms per kilogram body weight per day. The females, it was 1,400 micrograms kilogram body weight per day. Um, the overall or observations that were uh, expressed during this dosage was decreased food consumption in both sexes. Um, for the males, there was increased body, liver, and kidney weights. And for the females, there was a decreased body weight and water consumption. However, there was an increase in uterus weight. Uh, they were able to determine uh, a NOEL of 100 micrograms per kilogram body weight per person per day um, for the males. And for the females, um, 140 micrograms per kilogram body weight uh, per day. The milligrams, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, milligrams. Thank you so much. Um, and then the, there was also a uh, in, vitro, uh, in vitro genotoxicity study that was conducted that they found, um, they found no negative reportings of genotoxicity assays. So with this two-year rat study, um, they uh, Dr. Bandelay determined that it was the most appropriate um, study that was conducted. FDA wasn't able to review the re full report. However, uh, the United Kingdom Committee was able to review the report. Um, they were able to determine that a NOEL of 100, 100 microgram, I mean, excuse me, milligrams, uh, per kilogram body weight per day uh, by applying a safety factor of 100, which resulted in a TDI of one milligrams per kilogram body weight per day. And so looking at this value, um, we, we, we found that the, the, the test was appropriate um, and we saw no need to modify the TDI that was calculated um, by the United um, Kingdom Committee. Of course, we had no additional data to dispute this value either, so we considered this to be the most appropriate daily intake uh, for oil exposure to epoxidized soybean oil for food contact applications. Now, if you remember, I talked about our uh, cumulative uh, estimated daily int intake for ESPO for the use in these food contact materials of being eight eight milligrams per person per day. Um, using a body weight um, for the adult population, uh, we were able to determine, uh, we were able to determine a, uh, a CDI of 0.13 micrograms per person, micrograms kilogram body weight per day. Using a margin, uh, using a, a uh, using the NOEL of 100 milligrams per person, milligrams, kilogram body weight per day, uh, we were able to determine a, a margin of exposure of 769. So by applying the 200-fold uh, safety factor um, as what we do in DFCN, uh, we found that the, the use or the current dietary exposure estimate for ESPO was in the acceptable range. In this case, the margin exposure was significantly higher than the margin of safety, which was the 200-fold safety factor that was applied. So to wrap up the work that we did, we were able to determine uh, the use of epoxidized soybean oil and food contact materials um, both in uh, gaskets as well as in film. 
um, we were able to uh, understand the levels at which ESPO is being used, and I think this also comports with some of the work that Katie has done in the lab as it relates to ESPO, around 30 to 45 percent of ESPO. Um, we were also able uh, to determine a, a cumulative exposure estimate for epoxidized soybean oil in both gaskets and film. And with using the toxicology information uh, that we obtained in the literature, we were able to uh, determine that ESPO, of course, is acceptable. Uh, there are no safety issues for ESPO use in these food contact materials. And so where do we go next? Well, as I mentioned previously, uh, we have our infant guidance. Uh, it is currently being updated. Uh, and so I think it's important uh, to consider our precious cargo, which is our, which are our infants. They eat out of, you know, glass jars. And so we want to consider looking at um, the use of plasticizers in these small jars um, for infant foods. Um, and then also consider the exposure, dietary exposure and safety assessment of these other non-phthalates like citrates and terephthalates. If you think back to that original uh, picture or graph that I showed, there are, all, there are a lot of other alternative phthalates that are being used in the marketplace for food contact materials. Um, so we, we consider this is an, another option uh, for a post-market project. And so with that, I think I saved us by three minutes in our lunch break. Um, thank you for your attention. And um, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask.